Hello there, Mrs. DeMeyers here, and today we are going to go over the annotations for the Chaparral Habitat article. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a moment and just go over some of the annotations I made. Um, remember, these are not the only annotations. You're, when you do your annotations, you need to make sure that it's your thinking and your questions and your observations. Um, but I'm just going to take a moment and uh, show you what I did. So make sure that you either have a physical copy of your Chaparral article. So I have mine here that I marked on. And if for some reason you can only access it online and you don't have a way to print it, that's okay. Um, just take a piece of paper and you can make your annotations right on a piece of paper. You can ask your questions right there. Uh, you can draw pictures on it. So, you know, think outside the box. So either get your printed copy out or go ahead and grab your piece of paper and let's do some annotations together, okay? So first of all, here is our first page. Uh, first thing we like to do, let's look at the pictures. I like the pictures, of course. So this is the Chaparral Habitat. We've got some of our our um, thick shrub here. Here's a bird, a moth, a rattlesnake, and the California grizzly bear. And I looked at this picture and I made the, I asked the question, where in the world is this habitat found? Because I was curious, is it only in California? Are there other places? And so that was a thought that I had. So I want you right now, if you don't have any annotations yet, make sure you pause the video, write down a question, make an observation, on your article and then you can restart our video together. Okay, so go ahead, pause the video now if you need to and take and do that. Okay, so now you've got an annotation, at least on the picture of a question and, and or an observation. Let's go ahead and look at the body of the article. So you can see here, I underlined a whole bunch of stuff. So what I'm underlining here is I'm just underlining things that st stick out to me. So for here, I have a question, you know, is the article makes the statement that it's the most common habitat in California, the chaparral. So my question is, is it all over California? Is it just in part of California? I underlined here some of the things that you can find in the chaparral ecosystem. I have a question here. I wanted to know where did the grizzly bear go? Because it just says that the article says it was also where the grizzly bear once roamed. Well, if it once roamed, that means it's not roaming anymore. So what happened to it? Where did the grizzly bear go? Um, right here, I underlined or boxed dense cover of shrubs. So one of the things when you're annotating an article, it's all about making it yours or you're, you're reading the information and you're digesting the information. So one way to do it is to underline things. Um, but another way to do it is to put things in your own words because when we re, it's called rephrasing and we re, when we rephrase things, it can help us understand um, what someone is trying to communicate to us. In this case, what the author is trying to communicate in this article about the chaparral. So what I did is I re, rephrased the phrase dense cover of shrubs and I just said thick bushes. Your rephrasing can just be simple. It's whatever helps you understand or even what helps you remember um, what is the information that's trying to be communicated. So that was one of my rephrases here. If we go up here, we found out that the chaparral is Southern Oregon to Baja, California. So again, this answers my question of, is it all over? Or again, it's that whole where question, where is the chaparral found? Especially from the first picture that we had, I was asking. Um, I underlined that there are a few trees and trees are very rare. I wanted to know why. Why do we not find trees in the chaparral? And I also noted that the Douglas fir to me sounded like the name of a Christmas tree. I think I've heard of Douglas fir Christmas tree. So I was wondering, is this the same Douglas fir that we sometimes find in the chaparral? Is that's a Christmas tree that we like cut down and bring into our house at Christmas time? Or is it some other, or am I mixing things up? So I had a question there. I made the note here that there's arid conditions because again, we talk about how they can survive long periods without rain. So there's some dryness going on down here. Whoops. I drew a picture and the article makes a statement that rain in the chaparral always falls in late autumn and winter and rarely in summer. So what I did is I drew a picture of a cloud with some raindrops and I had it falling on late autumn. And here I have one winter with rain falling on winter. So remember they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And so this is another way like rephrasing that can help you re remember or understand information is by drawing little pictures um, in your articles or right on your pieces of paper, especially if you like to see pictures. So if you're somebody who, when you see a picture, you remember better, draw pictures in your, in your notes, draw pictures on your articles and then as you annotate and it'll just help you understand that information. Okay. So those are my annotations for the first page. Let's go to the second page. Take a look what we've got. Okay. So here the article goes on talking about where it's at. So we can see here, here's our picture. So it's this picture right here. I just blew it up so we could see it. This is a picture of where the chaparral is found. So 
when they say it's all over California, they really do mean all over. Um, there's a section here where chaparral is not found. I know there's a lot of vegetables grown in this area here. And then I know this is the desert of California. So this is like a different ecosystem where it's super, super, super dry. But our chaparral, this blue, is all along the coast here and then up here. So there really is covering a lot of the area of California. So let's take a look for a moment at some of our annotations here. What did I do? I commented or I underlined what the chaparral is like as far as it has a combination of hot, dry summers and mild, wet winters, and that this is a Mediterranean type of climate. And then these, if you look here on the map, this is where the Mediterranean climate is found. So it's found here in California, the Mediterranean basis, central Chile, Western Cape of South Africa, and South, Western and South Australia. And you'll notice here that it's found between very specific areas. So it corresponds to certain lines of longitude. Something else I noticed about these Mediterranean climates, and I'm actually noticing it as I'm doing the screencast here, is that if you look, they all have coast involved in them. So see how there's coastal areas here, there's coastal areas here, there's coastal areas in Chile, there's a coastal area here, and there's coastal areas here. We don't find these Mediterranean climates like landlocked, like in the dead center of land. So the ocean or the coastal areas have to be playing a role in what creates the Mediterranean climate, just thinking as I'm doing this. Okay, let's go back to our annotations on our article here. Let's see here. I said that the chaparral shrubs have tough leaves and that with waxy condition coatings and that these help to prevent water loss. But I was wondering maybe if this has a component of fireproofing or has something to do with, um, because when they are exposed to fire, I know they come back quickly. So d does the tough leaves and the waxy coatings have anything to do with fireproofing in some ways? Let's see here. Um, one of the things I highlighted is how the mountain lilac, they drop their leaves and that less leaves mean less water will be lost through evaporation. And then also I noted that the black sage, how the leaves curl up and look dead. I thought of this as like playing possum. Have you ever heard that? Where like, you, you know, you kind of like hover, cover your head or you can like do a play peekaboo with a kid um, or with like a young one. And I so I was kind of just wrote playing possum. So the black shrub plays possum, or excuse me, black sage plays possum. Um, let's see, what other annotations that I did I make here? Um, that the flowers, oh yeah. so. Early in December, shrubs like the man manzanita will start blooming and flowers in the winter. And so I thought, well, temperature has to play a role in this. In order for a plant to produce flowers, it needs a little bit of extra energy, right? And so because of our, our climate here in California, we know, especially where the chaparral is, we don't really get snow or it doesn't really get super, super cold like it would say in Minnesota or North Dakota. So I'm thinking, well, temperature has to play a role in this. One of the things I did, oh yeah, up here, I highlighted evergreen because that wasn't a word that I use all the time. So I was wondering, evergreen means they keep most of their leaves all year. And then here I highlighted the word adapted um, just because again, it wasn't a word I always use. So I thought it was an interesting one. And then let's talk about, see the article goes on to talk about the fires and how strong winds blow. And I know that a lot of times the strong winds are the Santa Anas. Um, so what happens is they come from the desert. In fact, if we go back to this picture right here, they come, there's a, there'll be an area of high pressure that'll be over like Nevada. And then the winds will blow this way. And the winds blowing across the desert, they pick up all the heat. And that's what causes our Santa Anas. And again, the article actually goes on to say that a sentence later. I got, I got kind of excited because I was like, oh, I knew it was a Santa Anas. All right. And then let's see here. Santa Anas from the desert. So I underlined that. Let's go ahead and go on to page three. Let's see here. What did I write about? Um, oh, so it says that the chaparral burned probably once every 50 to 100 years. Now with so many fires caused by people, some areas are covered by the chaparral are burning every 10 years or less. So my question was, what is the source of all the fires? And I know, for example, just last, uh, a couple of years ago now, there was a fire. This is up in Shasta County um, in an area called Redding. And this is the Sundial Bridge. And I've actually been to this area of town. There was a fire up there called the Car Fire that burned a lot of an area called Whiskey Town National Park. And it actually burned, they lost a lot of houses in the outskirts of Redding area. But the thing about this fire is it was started by a person, but it was a total accident. So, so a lot of times when we talk about fires caused by people, um, we think somebody's out there with a lighter and they're setting fires. A lot of times the fires can be in, in the car fire case. It was actually somebody was towing um, and their chain was dragging on the ground. So they were towing. I don't know if it was a motorhome or a boat and the chain actually sparked 
And I think either the, the chain sparking or there was an accident or something. And that's what caused the fire. And it was a complete accident. Nobody meant to cause the fire. Um, but because of the, the car, because the car accident and the chain dragging on the ground, creating sparks, that's what did it. Um, I know there was another fire up in Sonoma County and that one was caused by power poles and the power poles fell down. The electricity sparked and it started a fire. So a lot of times the way humans are causing fires is not intentional. It's not that people are setting fires, but rather the results of us living in certain areas or things that we do or things that we make are actually starting the fires. And so let's see here. The article went on to talk about how a lot of the natural habitat can be destroyed by non-native weeds and grasses. And I thought, well, which ones and how did they get there? And why are the non-native weeds and grasses um, surviving longer? And let's see here. Um, I highlighted root burl, burls. And so a root burl is this right here. So I drew some arrows on my picture. It's where the tree dies and then the green grows up from the roots. And I drew a little picture of it just so I could understand. Um, the article went on to talk about how there are seeds in the soil that can hide and they can be up, they can hide up to a century or more. So a century is a hundred years and that they are actually cracked open by the heat. And I should, yep, this is called a fire poppy here. This is one of the species of flowers where when fire comes, they are either, two things can happen. Either with the seeds, they can either be cracked open by heat or they can be exposed to chemicals found in the wood, in the, in the smoke, in the charred wood. And one of those chemicals is actually, I believe, nitrogen dioxide, I believe is the chemical. And it actually causes a, the seed to change to where, it can, to where it can sprout. So a lot of times after fires, what you'll see is you'll see like the black from the ashes and black from the charred woods. But then you'll see flowers like this growing right up out of there. And so I also drew a little picture here. These are the little seeds and that they're, I said that shh, they're hiding. So it's one of my pictures talking about how seeds hide in the soil. And then let's see here. And it's the fire that awakens the seeds. So those are my annotations on that page. Let's go ahead and go over to the next one. And I looked at the picture and I just thought, so pretty. I love poppies. I was up in, I actually have some really cool photos of in, in the Antelope Valley, there's a poppy field and um, it's, it wasn't created by fire, but it's just pretty flowers in a field and I love flowers. <laughs> so moving on, um, let's see here. I highlighted that the most common shrub in the chaparral is chemise and that it has tiny leaves and it has white blossoms that turn brown. I thought it was interesting that chaparral comes from the Spanish word chaparro and it describes specific areas in Spain covered by a scrub oak. Um, which is another common chaparral shrub. And the scrub oak is like a short oak tree. So I went ahead and underlined that. And then I thought about, it was talking about the man's, manzita, manzanita flowers and how the tree has urn-shaped flowers and they're an important source of nectar for hummingbirds and insects. So I found a picture. These are the urn-shaped flowers. I thought they would be turned like the other way, but they're actually facing down, which makes more sense. And then I thought about how, well, this kind of makes a food web, like we, we were talking about with our moon jellies and our energy storage molecules. So I thought about how, oops, let me move my head. I thought about how, put me over here, how the hummingbird gets its energy storage molecules from the flower here, and then also other insects. So I found a picture, this is a European honeybee getting um, nectar directly from this flower. And so this is a very important um resource population for these consumer populations here. So you can imagine that if something were to happen to these trees, whoops, let me go get my picture back here. There we go. If something were to happen to these flowers, there wouldn't be enough energy storage molecules here for the hummingbirds or for the insects. So it could be a case like our orange bellied parrots. We could have an, a case where the bursts are decreasing because they don't have enough energy storage molecules to feed, or it could be that our deaths are increasing because they're starving and they're dying. So again, there's food webs everywhere. We just have to, in nature, there's, everything is dependent upon, upon a food web and you're going to see these anywhere you look. So I'm going to move my head back over here. Kind of weird to move my head around, but that's okay. All right, let's keep going with our article and see it talked about hair how the ex the California grizzly bear is extinct. So extinct means no longer living. Those There are no more of them. Um, once a population goes extinct, we can't bring them back. We do not have Jurassic Park technology, at least not yet. Um, I don't know that we ever will, but you know, it's amazing what science can do. One of the things about this article I found was interesting is it talked about trails that bears made 
and that some of them may exist hidden under the shrub canopy for you to discover. So I Googled this. I was like, I want to see what trails made by bears a hundred years ago look like. And I couldn't find any pictures and I couldn't find anything. So I'm curious where these trails are located. Um, I don't know, maybe if you know, maybe you can find out, but I couldn't find anything about trails made from California grizzly bears. Could you imagine like how big their paw prints were? And if you could just like look on the ground and see these giant paw prints of forged trails. I just thought that would be amazing. All right, let's go to our next page here. Oh, he's really cute. These little baby cougars are cute when they're babies. And I can't imagine like taking, trying to take care of a big one when they get older. Okay. So the article goes on to talk about the rennet bird and how this is a small gray songbird and that it has a call with the rhythm of a ping pong ball. And I was like, what is this bird? I've never heard of this bird before. And so here we go. I found these pictures of it and oops. And one of the things I noticed as I was looking at the bird is how long its legs are. It has really long legs. It has little tiny feet and it has a long tail feather. And so I just thought that was interesting, just making observations, because that's what we do as scientists, we make observations. And I wanted to hear what its call sounded like. So I went ahead and I found a sound effect of it, and I'm going to play that for you now, okay? So again, a lot of times when we're reading articles, what I'm doing is I'm just finding things that are interesting to me. Okay, so I was interested in the bird and I was like, what, what is this bird? What does it look like? What does it sound like? And so I went and did a quick little Google and found, found out some information. And as you're going along reading, I'd encourage you to do the same thing. What, what interests you? What, what do you have more questions on? And then go and just find something that interests you um, and go look it up. Because in reality, that's what that is something that we all do through life. And it's a great, it's a great skill set to have is the ability to just kind of like go with the flow and look things up. Okay, so going back to our article, um, again, I highlighted more of the animals that are found in the chaparral. I highlighted down here that there's cougars, bobcats, coyotes and gray foxes. So this will be at the top of the food pyramid. These are going to be your, you know, your, your top top consumers kind of like the uh, the blue whale was with the moon jellies. Was it the blue whale? No, it was a whale. Yeah, I think so. And um, so for the next article, I had talked about snakes. And whenever I think of snakes, although I think snakes are cool. So in my classroom, I will have a snake for a pet. That is a goal of mine. Um, I love snakes. My husband is not too keen on the idea because he knows when for the summertime it will come to our house. But I'm okay with that. Um, but a lot of people call snakes nope ropes. I saw that one time on a gardening community. I thought it was funny. So whenever I think of snake, I think of nope rope. Nope rope. And uh, one of the snakes they talk about is the red diamond rattlesnake. So here's the rattlesnake here. He kind of looks pretty good, top of the shape of the head. And you'll, you're going to hear more about snakes on Mr. Vanagriff's podcast, the other podcast, or not podcast, screencast, um, for lesson 1.3, number B, or letter B. And so I went on to going through the article. I went ahead and just annotated the wood rat home, little arrow here. And this is our little wood rat guy. Kind of looks a little bit like, in some ways, um, what was the creature for the moon jellies? The Poteros, the Poteros mouse guy, or the, the actual, that was actually a mars, marsupial. Uh, but I always thought it was a mouse at first. So he kind of looks like him a little bit. And then let's go to the next. This is our last page here. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in here. Um, it also noted, the article noted that pocket gro gophers, pocket gophers are common in the chaparral. And I, think, I thought about the gophers in my front yard. Um, whoops. Uh, the article went on to say that the California Indians are the indigenous people. They use the natural resources found in the chaparral. For example, they ground the manzanita berries into meal to make mush or cakes. And I wanted to know what does a manzanita, man, manzanita berry taste like? Is it like a, you know, like a raspberry or a blueberry or nothing like that? I've never ha ha tasted a manzanita berry before. Um, the article noted that they use the leaves from the tree to treat several illnesses. And there's actually a lot of medicine that we have um, that comes from plants. A lot of just simple things like, you know, drinking chamomile tea if you're upset or peppermint tea if your stomach's bothering you. There's a lot of plants and a lot of things we can find in nature to help us treat um, like sicknesses and, and illnesses and things like that. And a lot of the first medicines all came from plants. There's, let's see here, it talks about, oh, this is a painting here, and this is a Chumash Indian cave painting. And I wanted to know 
what did they use for paint? And another question I didn't write it down, but I was thinking, how did this last so long? Like, you you know, this has got to be, goodness, at least 100, 150 years old. How is it still so beautiful and, and vibrant? And then I'm wondering, I look at it and I'm wondering, like, what does it mean? Because you notice there's there's gear. It looks like a gear here. And this looks like a gear. So is it a gear? Is it a sun? Like, what is this? Is this a, a bug or a sailboat? So I'd encourage you take a moment and look at the painting and see what you see in it. This looks like a sun to me. Maybe an Indian head. Maybe make a couple observations of just what do you notice and what do you wonder about this painting here? And then let's see here. Um, the article notes that it's impossible to walk through uh, the chaparral. And that would be, remember, we talked about our thick bushes before, our dense shrubs. So I put that's probably the reason why there. And then finally, for the picture, I noticed, so this picture, I was looking at it and I thought, okay, well, it looks like it's kind of green and there's clouds overhead here. So it's probably not a drought going on. So I made that observation. And that it was probably, we know from, reading the previous article that there's the most rain in the fall or the winter. And so I thought, well, maybe they took this in fall or winter because again, these kind of look like storm clouds to me, like it might rain. Um, so I knew this was probably not in the summertime because it was green and there, a fire hadn't just happened because again, it's green. And so those are the observations that I wrote about the chaparral covered mountain, mountain. So make sure you take a moment and write some, write some of your observations down too. Okay. So on that's the annotation of the article. And then there's also some questions that you need to answer. Now these questions are found in the, your packet or on the website and make sure you take a moment and write down on a piece of paper. You wanna write down what is the most interesting thing that you learned about the Chaparral article or from the Chaparral article and why. You need to list two or more, two to four or more facts that you learned about the Chaparral. That's a typo there. So it should be two to four or more facts that you learned about Chaparral. And then finally, you need to make sure that you go to this website here and explore the tabs and learn more about the Chaparral. And then you need to write down two new things that you learn from exploring this website. So if you're watching this, this uh, video, I'm assuming that you have internet access. And so you would go ahead and go to this website. And I'm just gonna go ahead and open it up here just so you can see it. Here we go, this is what it looks like. And you can go down here and explore some of the tabs. I was looking at, I think, was it climate change maybe? There's a couple I was looking at. And it talks about climate change here. Oh, here we go. It talks about, oh, there's about owls. Let's see what this one is. Oh, this is about burrowing owls. So these owls actually take over burrows in the ground. So here, so you can just basically go on the site, hunt around, find something that looks interesting to you. So if you like owls, look, about, look up the owls of wolves. That's a great topic. Chaparral myths, that could be something really interesting here. Oh, here we go. There's lots of myths and facts about that. So, yeah, so go ahead and uh, search out this website and then make sure you write down two to four, excuse me, two new things that you learned about the Chaparral. And then when you're done with all of this, you can either turn this in with your, an your annotated article and your questions with your packet work. So just like if you've been um, having a parent or a friend or someone drop off that work at school, it can just be sent with that as usual. Or you can always take a picture and send it to your teacher by email. So I hope this helps. I hope you have a great weekend and um, I will see you later. Bye.